Thank you. <laughs> I'd forgotten. But anyway, it's good to be with you, and uh, I'm happy to be with you this weekend, and I'm sorry that uh, we have to be still remote, but Lord willing, this will change very soon. And uh, I hope what I have to say today will be very encouraging, something that you can use as you work this week in Christ. And when I say work this week in Christ, it should not surprise you. As a Christian, there's a walk that we have that needs to be very particular. It needs to be very exacting. It needs to be able, we need to be able to show others who we are distinct from the world. Not to, to make people ashamed necessarily, but to show them that there is something much better. And so that's my aim this morning. This lesson also may help you to be encouraged about my thoughts about you and what our work might be together and what you might see and expect of me and what I would hope and expect from you. That's why I've chosen it. We're going to talk about a living sacrifice, but we're going to look at it from three different verses in this text. I apologize for not having the verse 11 included. I'd forgotten that that was the one I wanted as well. But you're going to find in verse 1, verse 7, and verse 11 of Romans chapter 12, the, the, uh, the concept of service or serving. And the interesting thing is, is there are three different Greek words that have the same kind of application from a different perspective. So I label this, or I would title this lesson, the three aspects of Christian service. And so I want you to be encouraged about the things that we have to say this morning. And when you think about service, what do you think about? Well, you might, in, in a modern context, think of the the person that serves you at a restaurant. Unfortunately, right now, you've been so far removed from that, you may have forgotten what that was like. But nonetheless, I've had the privilege of going out to restaurants in my home state. And yes, there are servers to serve. Maybe with, a, with masks now, but I reminded that that is a person that serves. As, my, as I traveled on my journeys, I had the United Airlines uh, representative serving me. I've had the hotel uh, guest service serving me. And all of these people are servants, but they do it for remuneration, for pay. They certainly enjoy the benefits of that. That's not to diminish their work, but their work isn't uh, what we're talking about this morning. What Paul is stressing here from this text in Romans, the 12th chapter, and that's what we need to shoot for, we need to aim for. And that is that service that, again, if there is any remuneration, we'll have to consider it from our heavenly perspective. And most importantly, though, this service is to develop our character, our image that God has created us in, that is, His image, to show us more Christ-like and to enthuse us and to, to get us excited for our work in the Lord. Now, let's look at the first one. The first Greek word that we find there for service or is also considered or called worship. And if you, as was read this morning, um, that we are to... And I'm going to read from the CSB this morning, not the New King James. But it says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is what they say in the CSB. This is your true worship. Well, that's the word we're looking at. Your reasonable service, as you heard this morning. And, and so that word, latria, is that word worship or service. And the, and the ideal is for veneration. It, it's the, the ritual acts of worship that we oftentimes attribute to assemblies, the corporate assemblies, like we're doing this morning. But let's not just look at it in its technical aspects, because it goes even beyond that. It stretches beyond just what we're doing this morning. It would include our private works with one another, our prayers together, our singing, our thoughts and meditations that are, are being, because it says our bodies are to be become that living service. Your instrument is your body. It is to be wholly devoted. In fact, that word in the Greek, if we were to translate it probably even more beautifully in English, it'd be the word devotion. That's what he's asking of us. That's what Paul's saying is that God wants our devotion when he wants our living sacrifice. Now, Sometimes when we look at that text in verse 1, we think of it as opposed to uh, the old law. And of course, the sacrifices were dead sacrifices, right? In other words, a person brought their sacrifice to God, I mean, excuse me, to the priest. And the priest would offer that, whether it be a free will, whether it be a burnt sacrifice, whether it be the one that's for the Day of Atonement that the priest would offer for the people. It is true that there is that opposition or contrast, you see. 
but it's much deeper and much richer than that. And as much as that we understand that we are to be devoted wholly to the Lord, it is a difficult task, to say the least, to give yourself wholly to God. We can say that that's what we're to do. We may say that that's what our aim is. But when you measure it on an hourly or a daily basis, the reality is that so often we are very selfish persons. We're not quite the living sacrifice we should be. I'm not here to beat you up over that. I'm looking inward. I'm looking outward. I'm saying that we better pay attention to this. And I want you to be encouraged to think about that. That when, when you come together, and this can be a measurement, and we come together in assembly. Unfortunately, as we've talked about, we're not able to come together physically. But when we do, are we animated? And I don't mean to say that we're flaying about and shouting and, and doing all kinds of erratic things. I'm talking about a deep of passion that says, I want to be here because this is the place that, that, that God wants me to be. This is the place that I will be for all of eternity. And I don't mean the location, but I mean that assembly, that holy assembly. Do you realize that the worship assembly mirrors that perfect eternal assembly forevermore? Think about that, friends. Isn't that impressive to imagine? See, a lot of times we think of our worship assembly as, okay, our weekly assembly. We come together on Sunday. We have these five acts of worship. We're going to make sure that we perform them correctly, and then we will hopefully enjoy one another's company in that process, and that we will offer worship to God that's holy or right. But we offer holy worship to God. It's more than just the ideal of we get it right. We do get it right, but for the right reason, that we have an aim that is so true to be as close as we can to our Savior, to know what it's going to be like to be with Him forevermore. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Isn't that a, a beautiful thought? And so what it causes in us, and hopefully it stirs in us, is a desire to go out and fight that good fight. Have you ever wondered why sometimes in your life or in my life, it's difficult to live faithfully week to week? You know, when you go to work, you go to school, you go out there in the world, you interact with people in the world, and you know they're not always pleasant. Sometimes your experiences are, are terrible, and you know you have a bad work week ahead of you, etc. And there are so many worldly people that you have to engage with, and it's so difficult, and you become so uh, 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 downtrodden and stricken, and so then you become depressed. Well, you want to be enthused, so you come back to an assembly. You come back to midweek worship, uh, Bible study, or Sunday worship, and hopefully you're re-energized. That's part of the ideal of that word. But I'm here to tell you, friends, that in order to do better at it when you're not with your those of like precious faith, those whom you love dearly, and hopefully you do, then you have to, you have to develop the heart of a worshipful attitude, a devoted spirit to God, no matter where you're at, so that you can be as Paul and Silas in a prison, and as we see in Acts 16 and verse 25, and singing praises to the Lord in the worst of conditions. I've seen brethren like that that have had terrible experiences, and some of you all have health issues that are beating you down and just dragging you to the ground. How do you, how do you react to that? It is unpleasant, and sometimes you're not going to feel so well, but can your spirit be lifted can you recognize your devotion to the Lord? And that's what Paul's calling us for, so that we develop that heart and we do it well so that we can enthuse others to do well in that. It is our whole heart, our whole body. So that means when we give ourselves up, we're not our own. We are his. We're going to see more of that developed in the, the next part. But understand this. We are to give our life wholly to God none of self and all of thee as we sing when we finish that last line of that song the second word this word for service is the word we find ministry it's in verse seven we we in most of our text it'll say ministry now the csb does use the word service it says if service use it in service well that sounds pretty perfunctory in ministry use it for service or for good of course he talks about other aspects of service i think teaching can be uh is very specific aspect of service that we would render one. Service is a very generic word in this text because we get our word deacon from it. 
Dakania. Dakania, as it's called here. So we think of it typically as an office, a person that serves in the capacity under shepherds to do certain functions, like we have this morning, someone's hosting, somebody's had to get the bulletins together, someone's uh, been assigned to lead songs. Maybe when we're back or at a building that you have certain functions in order to make sure that we're able to worship right, and things that have to be taken care of, some things that are auxiliary to our worship, some things are very specific. Well, that is the the word that we're using here. However, I want you to expand your understanding beyond just the office and note this, that Paul was calling every one of us to service. Every one of us, as we say, to deaconhood or deaconship, however you want to describe it. So in, he's enjoining us to have a fervency of service, a heart that's saying, here am I, send me, as uh Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, I believe, here am I, send me. You see, beyond the official characteristics, we're not going to be restricted. We're not going to be bound. We're not going to be held back. That whatever is good that I can do for you, then I do it. Now, this is where the, the, the concept of selfishness is going to be either on display or the concept of selfless nuts is going to be on display. And if we're honest with ourselves, we probably waver. We go up, we go down in that. Maybe we're more servant-like and other times we're not so. And we have to adjust and fix that problem, don't we? I have to admit that. There are times when I do very well at this and other times, uh oh, I forgot this. I forgot that. And I wasn't really intending to. I'm not arguing that we are intentional, that, oh, we disregard one another. But you see what happens. Our lives get in the way, don't they? We say that. What it means is, is this, this life in the temporal affairs, our work, maybe the problems of our job, maybe the problems within our families, they get in the way of our concerns for others, particularly one another. And how we react and how we respond to one another is very important. And that's why sometimes feelings get hurt because people are overlooked. And, I, and again, like I said, I think most brethren do not do it intentionally, but we get busy and life gets in the way. So we've got to work hard at correcting that from time to time and readjusting and tweaking and, and, and maybe even reminding one another, you know, you, you were used to do this a lot. Is there something that's challenging you or making it difficult for you to do that? Something I can maybe pick up the slack, like in Galatians chapter six and verse two, uh, I think that there is more to it than sin. I think the first verse says that we're to restore one another in a spirit of gentleness, but this bearing one another's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ, Galatians 6 and verse 2, I think carries with it also the understanding of the burdens that we have in this life. They don't necessarily, uh, are, are, are not necessarily attributable to our sin, but rather our lives are difficult, and so we're going to pick up that load, and maybe I need to pick that up from time to time. And so that we have a servant-like heart, that when Paul says it, he says, when you do it, you do it well. That's why he talks about the teacher and the giver. It's not to say that we're not to be givers, uh, all of us, but those who especially are good at it. You see, when you read this word, I want you to think back, and I want you to read this week, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27, and you'll get a fuller picture of each one of our responsibilities in that regard. To, to re-examine ourselves and say, what can I do in the kingdom of the Lord? You're right. Sometimes it's difficult to find that, that place and that niche because we get so strict and limited in our understanding of what our work is. Typically, and unfortunately, sometimes we see the preacher as a very important man. Maybe we see the, the elders as a very important persons and deacons, and maybe uh, in worship, the person leading song or the person leading in prayer. So all of these guys or persons have an important function, but, you know, I don't really have anything to offer, or I don't really have anything to offer this week. And because I have other issues in my life, I can't offer it well. Well, here's the deal. We've got to reexamine that, and we've got to rethink this. And that's where 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 27. You know, one of the most impressive things to me 
at, at times when I find elderly members, particularly that maybe even shut in, that aren't able to get out like they should would normally or otherwise or do the things that they used to be able to do. They were always good at cards. It was always, always good at phone calls. It's always good at those sorts of things. And, and they helped encourage and lift you up and strengthen you. You know, when you read Acts, the ninth chapter in verse 36, and you read of that lady named Tabitha, I like that name better than Dorcas, incidentally, but you know, we, we understand that in English, but her name is Tabitha. And here she is, a woman that they're weeping and mourning over the widows are and saying, guess what she's done for us and others. She's made coats. She's made clothes. What better reason for her to be revived from the dead? Because she still has unfinished business, doesn't she? Wouldn't that be wonderful to be that to be said of you? That though you may be sick, may you may be ill, there may be issues that you have in your life, though you may want your reward and we want it for you, that there's so much more that you can offer me that I need from you. And there's much more time that I need to spend with you. And that's the heart of deacon. That's the heart of this word here, diakonia that is serving or ministry, is that not only do we find that niche, but we're especially good at, yes, are they wealthy brethren? That's what he talks about there at the end, do it well. But our service to God must be discovered. There isn't one of us, whether it be single, be married, old or young, that don't need to be busy in the kingdom. And when you put that together and you weave it together with all of the works going on, you're going to have a healthy, vital church. And the discouragement that will come from time to time will be easily overcome. There will be a rejuvenation and a strengthening of one, you see. So therefore, verse 7 tells us very plainly, do it without restriction. Do it with your wholeheartedness. Offer your Christian living sacrifice to your fellow saints unto the Lord, obviously, in praise and glory and honor to his name. And I will also assure you that those who witness you doing that, and as much as they see you do this publicly, that are outside the body of Christ will see that. There's your part of your reason of the hope that lies within you, that people will witness and be able to say, aha, I think there's something here. I want that. I want to be a part of that. Can you tell me how to be a part of that? People love to belong, don't they? Who, who wants to be a loner? There's very few people that just want to go it alone. A lot of us want people. And we want people to be with us and we to be with them. We want love. We want affection. We want appreciation, right? And so consequently, this word serves that purpose. We need to get better at it. And we need to understand that it is so important that we see our work. And it's a special service that we offer. And it should not be diminished. The third item, verse 11. It says there in that particular text that we are to... Uh, do not lack in diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord, he says. Serve the Lord. All right. We get our word slave from this. This is the word that's probably more closely tied in direct uh, language as far as translation. We get our word slave, our word servant. Now, that word is very dynamic, and it, it reads more than, as we pointed out before, our job as um uh, that we might, we might serve another person because it's our job, for instance. We get paid to do that. This is actually, I am now becoming your slave. I no longer belong to myself kind of word. Uh, it really, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the hard stuff. Now, what I saw before in Deacon, if I might back up just for a second, uh, and I, if you don't mind, I will use Todd as an example. You know, when you have a job like his and you serve people that are coming out of the system and hopefully to get back into society, there can be a great opportunity to show them what really good living is. And to the best of your ability, if there's any interest, and all of us need to find that niche, as we said before. And somebody will see that humbled character. So that moves us into directions that we see here of slavehood. When that becomes our persona, our characteristic, then what we inevitably have is something that people outside say, this is not what the world looks like. Have you ever wondered why people were so enthused in the early days of Christianity? When you read the Acts of the Apostles, and you read particularly chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 even, you get this chapter 6, and it's just at the end of a section there in chapter 6 that you find even among the priests that they obey the gospel. Now that's remarkable because, number one, 
they were paid to work as priests. So they lost their jobs if they became a Christian. Number two, they were under higher or greater scrutiny because that was a select group of people that you knew well. And so the priest, if they were already targeting Christians, we're going to target them first and foremost. So they gave up a great deal in order to be Christians. And so that's just the ideal that we need to see, that we are slaves before the Lord. And there's a great motivation to do that, as we see early on, because there's a community of believers that they act differently than everyone else. In Jesus' world, the average Jew was not acting like the law required. And I don't mean just because they didn't keep it perfectly. It's, greater, it's a greater problem than that. They were oppressing the poor. Why do you think in the Gospels that you read about the people that are so poor among them and they're not being taken care of, like the rich man in Lazarus? Why do you see such the scrutiny of Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors? Because there was all that technical aspect, and you got to keep these certain things. And according to the traditions of the elders or traditions of the priest or the traditions of the rabbis, and if you do that, then, hey, you're a good Jew. And you do this exacting. I mean, they had gotten to the point as Jesus rebukes them that they thought giving a little portion of a gift or a tribute to the temple treasury would relieve them of the responsibility of taking care of their parents. That's how sick and sad they had become. That they actually thought that the day in and day out responsibilities could actually be relieved by such a service. But you know what? They wanted it that way and the priest wanted it that way and they told them that. This is the society that Christianity grew out of. Does it surprise us that it grew from 3,000 to 5,000 by Acts 5? Does it surprise us that the priests became so? Does it surprise us that though they were scattered in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, that they went everywhere preaching? I'm telling you, if you live the life as a Christian and you really develop that slavehood, servanthood attitude, it's going to be seen, especially in a very dark and sinful world where everybody is selfish and looking out for number one. So in context, Paul says, Christians, you be slaves. You be slaves to one another for my sake. Because didn't Jesus really do that? I mean, you don't even, we don't even really fully grasp the impact of Philippians 2, uh, the Paul's argument in Philippians chapter 2, when he says that he left everything. We don't even know what leaving everything is all about. You know, if I leave my home place and come to a place like this area that I'm not familiar with people other than Christians now, and I got to develop those new relationships, I'm not sacrificing nothing, nothing like Christ, nothing even remotely close to it, because he left the glories of heaven, which we can't even imagine at this point yet. We have not even seen. We can only imagine, I suppose, but even then it falls very short of the reality he was equal with God. He was eternal. So it goes beyond just the place, but it's his position that he humbled himself so, so much that he came and put on the form of man and lived among men and died, as Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following teach. I lose my identity. I lose myself. Well, I say I lose my identity. I lose my identity as myself in the flesh and I regain a new identity in Christ. That means that I'm going to push all the boundaries, and I'm going to push so hard that you're going to see nothing but my service to you, and likewise that when people are outside looking and witnessing that, that when they see that, they are extremely excited about the potential. If they have an honest heart that says there's something better in this life, they're going to see it. Let us work on that. It's great. It's a great opportunity for us. So as we conclude, we need to notice some, just a few things here. Number one, as we talked about the first aspect, we have a complete picture now of the entire life of service as a Christian. Verse one tells us we are, our bodies are offered up. In other words, we're already going to reform our identity because now we're not our own. And therefore, we become a living sacrifice. Our bodies become the instrument. Number two, as we see in verse seven, now we're going to be naturally a person devoted. We have become, we have been formed, we've been shaped, we've been cultivated into a person devoted to assume that office of service. It's like as soon as we hear there's something to do, we're up. Here am I. What am I going to do? Or, or, or we maybe even anticipate before the time. What can I do next? I'm looking out ahead. What can I feel? What kind of responsibilities can I assume to help the body of Christ? to help my fellow saints, especially those I have personal and very intimate relationships with. 
And number three, that now because of that, guess what? I live my life in recognition that I am a slave now. I want to live right now in this life as if I don't own myself, that I'm owned by you for the sake of Christ, that I can't do nothing for myself, that I do all for you. That we can cultivate it and do it well, that I promise you, it'll make the body of Christ greater, stronger, healthier, and we'll all be not only rejuvenated, but as we pointed out, it won't be a problematic when we go out there in the world, because guess what? We know what we're going to be doing for our brethren, and we know what we can do for those that are outside of Christ, and we know what we get to come back to. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a beautiful picture? Let us be servants. May I encourage you in this? Do you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning? I want to encourage you to think about this because this is important. Now, we're here in the city now with you. And I assure you that I know that there's good brethren here. And if you need it, no matter what our concerns are, we're going to do what we need to do to make sure that you have obeyed, you, you've been able to obey the gospel as Christ required it. You need immersion for the remission of your sins. Let us help you. Do you need the prayers of the congregation? Let's ask for them. Let us ask for the encouragement and strength. And maybe you have sin that needs to be corrected. Well, we can help you with that because we're here to help one another. We're to pray for one another. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man truly avails much. Let us be servants. May I encourage in this as we sing the invitation song.